Welcome back everyone. My name is Monica Ruiz. I'm one of today's moderators. Thank you everyone for attending the forum in person and virtually today. We would like to let the audience know that all candidates were invited to today's event. Due to unforeseen circumstances, not all candidates will be attending here today. Originally, Dr. Kevin Ballin was confirmed to attend but is unable to join us. We would like to welcome the candidates that were able to attend today's event in person. Mr. Lou Zapera, Mr. Eric Gerhar, and Lieutenant Governor Fetterman. And virtually, Councilor Khalil, Congressman Connor Lamb, and State Representative Malcolm Pineda. Hello everyone, my name is Mila Senina, and I will also be another moderator for today's event. For the rules agreed to by each candidate, in the beginning, each candidate will be giving two minutes, 120 seconds, to give an introduction as to why they feel they are most qualified to be the next Senator of Pennsylvania. Each candidate will have a maximum of one minute, 60 seconds to respond to each question we ask. Each candidate can use one 30 second rebuttal per question. We will not allow candidates to converse back and forth. There are many issues that need to be addressed during this forum, and we only have a limited time to do so. We will have a 10 minute break midway through the forum. Next, we will reconvene to ask candidates questions from the public that have been submitted prior to today's forum or live on the World Affairs Council Facebook page or Casa San Jose's Facebook page. To all viewers watching from home, Please, if you have questions, submit them in the comment sections of the World Affairs Council Facebook page or Casa San Jose's uh, Facebook page. We will close today's forum with giving each candidate two minutes, again, 120 seconds, to give a conclusion as to why they feel they are the most qualified to be the next Senator of Pennsylvania. Our timekeeper will be keeping track of time and you will be able to see the time you have left on the TV screen below the moderator's table. Today's order will be determined at random by candidates picking a number out of a hat, which we did prior to this. Thank you to the University of Pittsburgh, specifically the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs for providing the venue for today's event. The moderators, the staff of the World Affairs Council, Casa San Jose, Hump, and the Women and Girls Foundation attendees and candidates for coming today that came together to make today possible. Candidates will now have the opportunity to share two minutes, which is 120 seconds, to introduce as to why you feel you are more qualified to be the next Senator of Pennsylvania. We'll be starting with Mr. Lou Tapera. Hello, my name is Lou Tapera. I'm running for US Senate for Pennsylvania, as you all know. I live in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm running for Senate because, and people should vote for me because I am the middle class. I'm the working poor. I've been a diabetic since I was 12 years old. I don't, I have not been to an endocrinologist in 10 years. Um, I don't have health insurance, I cannot afford it. And there's a million other people like me in this state and in this country and on this planet. And the middle class, the working poor are just underrepresented, but actually not represented in Congress. People throw, throw the red meat that, hey, I'll do this for you and I'll do that for you. But the fact, I, ha I don't have the money for this. It's, I have to pay $5,000 to the state of Pennsylvania on Monday just for this campaign. That's $5,000 I don't have. Um, so the fact I have to run is an indictment on the, those in, in, in power now. We say they help us, but they do not. So thank you. That's time. Lieutenant Governor Fetterman. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Governor oh, John Fetterman. I of apologize. I am so sorry. You get two minutes. I'm so sorry. You do have another minute. Uh, um, that's okay. I'm, I'm the, here you go. That's fine. <laughs> I'm happy to. Lieutenant Governor. Hi, I'm, I'm Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, and uh, I'm uh, just delighted to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about these important foreign policy issues. And I, and I want to thank everybody for organizing that. Uh, you know, the question was, we're here to talk about why we believe we're the most qualified. And, 
And that's not, respectfully not my job as a candidate. My job as a candidate, as, as I see it, is to talk about our record, talk about our campaign, and let you, the voters, decide who the most qualified is. And you know, from, from my perspective, you know, we're a different you know, kind of Democrat and, and always have been. Uh, the kind of campaign that we're running right now is the most powerful grassroots campaign of any challenge, a Republican or a Democrat nationally in the country. We have over 185,000 grassroots donors, and we have placed ourselves in nearly 90% of Pennsylvania zip codes. And that kind of grassroots enthusiasm translates into the most well-resourced challenger and someone that can really get out and challenge the Republicans in every one of our 67 counties, every one of them. I ran for the Senate for the first time back in 2016, and a lot of the policies I ran on were considered too left or, or too progressive. But now that platform is now really what everyone is running on nationally as a Democrat. And in terms of foreign policies, you know, when I ran six years ago, and now it's the same, I've spoke out forcefully about America's involvement in forever wars. I spoke out forcefully on how important and critical it is that we have a compassionate and common sense approach to immigration, it's shaped by my wife's family story as a former dreamer herself, and also how the best part of America is our promise to take care of the refugees that are coming to our country for a better life. That's the kind of campaign that we're running. We believe we can win in November, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Councillor Khalil. Thank you so much for having me here today, World Council of Pittsburgh. Excuse me, the last time I spoke in front of the World Council was in Philadelphia. I'm sorry, I didn't speak. The last time I attended was in Philadelphia many years ago. And Mikhail Gorbachev was a speaker there. Very ominous uh, moment. I'm just very proud to be here. Why should I be? Uh, why am I the most qualified? Well, I'm a local elected official. I'm the daughter of immigrants, Palestinian Muslim immigrants from the West Bank and East Jerusalem. I am the mother of a dyslexic child who's now an adult. I am an activist. And even as a candidate, I have spoken and met with I don't just say that I'm going to do something. I actually do it. I take those big steps. I deeply respect what our Lieutenant Governor has said. You know, I'm here to run on my values and the people of Pennsylvania will decide which way they'll, they'll vote for. And my values are that I believe in human rights. My values are that I believe in refugees being treated with dignity and being welcomed at our door. And that includes, I might add, uh, Haitian refugees, Palestinian refugees, Syrian refugees, uh, African refugees, and uh, Ukrainian refugees, and all the refugees of the world who come to our door seeking help. Uh, I, I'd like to point out that when, when uh, Haitian refugees were being whipped at the borders, very few comments were made. I was the only one to stand with the Philadelphia Haitian community and the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Haitian community and speak out. Why am I the most qualified when undocumented women from Brazil were being raped, domestic violence, their children were being abused? I sat with the Republican David O and listened to their concerns. When immigrant businesses were being robbed, I listened to them and I heard them. I've reached out to my various local representatives. Thank you, it's time for the next speaker. State Representative Kenyatta. Well, thank you so much. And it's a real privilege to, to, to be with you. This is a, a moment where frankly, our democracy's ability to deliver for working people is on the line. I think that it is time that we have a Senator who is laser focused on extending and making sure the basic bargain is accessible to every single family. When we think about the foreign crises that we face when we think about rising costs, when we think about issues of war and peace, climate change, so, many, so much of what we're going to discuss today, it's poor folks and working people that bear the brunt of our inaction. Everywhere I've gone across the Commonwealth, I've talked about this idea of making that basic bargain real for every single family. This idea that you can have one good job backed up by a union, that your kids can go to a good school. You don't have to district shop. You know that there's a good school in your neighborhood. 
that if you get sick, you can actually go to the doctor and be able to fill the prescription when you leave the appointment. And then you can retire with a level of dignity in a house that you were able to afford in the first place, in a neighborhood that is safe and clean. We've seen too well what the traditional political experience has gotten us. It's gotten us a lot of TV commercials, a lot of promises, and a lot of the same for working people. We need a new day in Pennsylvania. And that starts with new leadership, leadership that's grounded in the working class experience, leadership that is forceful about speaking out and fighting for our values, and leadership that can bring people together. And we've done that in this campaign bring together a bold coalition from all across the Commonwealth, organized labor, elected officials, community members, and so many others. And that's the type of leadership I'm gonna to bring to Washington. I look forward to your questions and appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Thank you. We'd like to note that Congressman Connor Lamb is joining us from DC and we'll have to leave early. Congressman Lamb. We can't hear you. Did you guys lose me in my back? Yes. Sorry, it's raining in the capital city of the United States and we have unstable internet. Um, I appreciate you making this accommodation. I'm about to go over to the Capitol to vote on a $15 billion aid package for Ukraine, which includes both lethal and defensive military aid uh, and also an enormous uh, amount of resources for humanitarian assistance to receive the refugees who are pouring over the border. Um, to care for them and potentially even to relocate many of them in the United States. Uh, it's a good example of the role that the United States still continues to play every single day around the world, a role that I think was um, tarnished or minimized during the year of years of the global war on terror, where uh, our government got involved in two wars simultaneously with a very military first approach. Uh, and I'm a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. One of the things that you'll see about veterans of my age group is that we are very familiar with the tools of military power and how they can be used. We are also extremely reluctant to make them the lead in American foreign policy anymore. Uh, and during the current conflict with Ukraine, uh, I think we are exhibiting the power of American diplomacy. Uh, we're in a world that is changing very quickly and that will uh, more and more with each passing year become a world full of conflict between autocracies like China, Iran, Russia, Venezuela, uh, and democracies like the United States, Europe, uh, Japan, South Korea. Uh, that those are gonna be the terms of the conflict of the next several decades. And our ability su to succeed in the long term, just like in the short term with Ukraine, is gonna have a lot to do with our ability to keep that block of countries working together, working together on economics, on human rights, on technology, and on military uh, aid in places that it is needed. Uh, the job of our next Senator in, in brief will be to advise and consent on nominations for the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense, uh, as well as to approve or disapprove treaties. Uh, I think that my viewpoint as a young veteran who's had some experience here in the Congress will be helpful and I'm looking forward to talking about that today. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Eric Gerhardt. Hello, my name is Eric Gerhardt. I am the Libertarian of Pennsylvania nominee for the Senator. I'm gonna do my due diligence to get on the ballot we have a saying in the Libertarian Party is that if you vote Republican or Democrat, you're voting for the same side of one coin, the duopoly. Um, we need a difference in change. That's true. Everybody's been saying it. But you're not going to get it with the same old, same old. You're not going to get it with old people who are in the same frame of mind. We need new leadership, term limits, multiple different avenues to actually address things instead of the way the government works right now is everything's sold out to the union with blank checks and you don't know what you're gonna get. We need plans put in place from the beginning that can be described to the people that are asking the questions, everybody out there, a plan of action, a way to get the thing done with that plan and how much it's gonna cost. We need to go back to the old way of doing business. I'm a 20 year carpenter. I work for the people. I work for all the people all over Pennsylvania. They want the best price, but they also want the best value. You can't be going out and just writing these blank checks and hoping for the best value. We need to 
shop around, find the best value for Americans, keep that price low so we can redistribute that to those people who need it. And I'm not gonna waste your time. I'm gonna end it right there and I'm gonna let the rest of my answers answer for me. Thank you. Thank you. Today's first topic will be healthcare. The question is, how does our healthcare system compare to those globally and how should we be trying to model our systems after them? How do we address the racial disparities in the healthcare industry? And this is, to go first would be uh, the Lieutenant Governor. I'm sorry, did you hear the question? No, okay. I, I, I didn't, is, is it my turn? It is. Oh. So healthcare, back in, 20, back in 2016, I uh, ran that healthcare is a basic fundamental human right. Uh, I was less fixated on what exactly it had to be other than the fact that everybody has a, a right to, to quality healthcare. And now that's a basic platform and pillar of the, of the Democratic Party. How does it compare to other industrialized countries across the world? Not well, quite frankly. You know, we have, uh, we have still fallen short uh, even with the Affordable Care Act of, of not being able to provide universal health care to our citizens in a, in a way that guarantees that access. And during the pandemic, I was chair of the, the Racial Disparities Commission here in Pennsylvania, just how impactful that the imbalance uh, in health care disparities among uh, people of color in Pennsylvania nationally uh, actually is, and working on a plan to, to address that. The, the black mortality rate is unacceptable in Pennsylvania nationally. And you know we cannot talk about healthcare without talking about the enormous disparities that we have racially in our country. Thank you. Councilor Khalil. Yes, um, I really believe that we, um, our healthcare has come a long way. First of all, I was a strong supporter of the Affordable Care Act. However, we are not uh, where we should be. I support, frankly, more the Australian model when you compare um, our current situation, uh, which and what is the Australian model? The Australian model is a public and private uh, entities. Uh, you have the option to get private and you have the option to get public. And the reason why I support that is when you sit back and take a look at wh where we are today as a nation, I think that'll get us there closer and quicker. I support uh, Medicare for all. And I think that that will get us to a Medicare for all option quicker. Currently, I support uh, Build Back Better, which would provide, which would lower Medicare, uh, uh, you to get into Medicare at 60, provide dental, eye, and uh, hearing aids. So I think that if we sit back and begin moving towards Medicare for all, uh, keeping private and having a public option. Uh, Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. State Representative Kenyatta. I think the best example of where we fit in the world is you have folks who are talking about going to Canada to get their insulin because it's too expensive here. And it highlights the fact that there is a lot of work that has to be done. And uh, Council and Khalil um, mentioned some of the thing, lower in the age of getting in Medicare, including hearing, vision, dental. But it's also gonna require us to take on these big pharmaceutical companies that have continually made it impossible for too many people to get access to life-saving treatments. I watched my mom ration her insulin for most of my life, bury both of my parents by the time I was 27 because they didn't have the type of health care they deserve. As your Senator, every or any bill that comes to the floor that expands access, that lowers costs, I'm gonna be a hell yes for that bill. And that's the promise I make to you. Congressman Lamb. Yeah, I think prescription drugs are the best uh, issue that, that actually kind of answer your question, which is how we're stacking up compared to the rest of the world. It's, it's easy for any politician to say, oh, yes, we want to cover everybody just like they do in France or Japan or whatever. But we know America has a very unique history when it comes to health care. Uh, that being said, we actually really are on the precipice of finally allowing Medicare to negotiate the price of prescription drugs. I was talking to um, someone who developed a cancer therapy earlier, and he told me that in 50 other countries around the world, he had to negotiate with somebody who worked for the central government of those countries, and they would allow him to make a nice price in the first year and then decline it over time. The U.S. is the opposite, where they allow the price of something like insulin to rise over decades long after the inventors are dead. Uh, we've twice passed a bill in the U.S. House 
that would allow that negotiation to take place and use the savings to add vision, dental, um, and hearing coverage. And if we get one or two more votes in the Senate, that could actually become law. Thank you. Mr. Eric Gerhardt. Uh, prescription drugs is an economic question, truthfully. There's so many regulations on the pharmaceutical companies that any small company can't start up unless they have a billion dollars of capital to start. If we lower regulations, allow smaller companies to come in, we can start the real capitalist system where there's price comparisons, where smaller companies are selling for cheaper, we'll bring the cost down, That'll help give more access to many people. We end Obamacare, which you're paying double for because I was on it because it's halfway subsidized. Half of that money just goes to the people that are selling you the insurance. So you're wasting about half the money just to that. The rest of it goes to the insurance itself, of which private is still cheaper. So giving people options and educating them a little bit, we can uh, probably figure something out. Thank you. Mr. Lutzapera. Um, so obviously this is uh, very close to my heart and you asked, how, do, how do I feel, uh, that the American healthcare, uh, system is an insurance. It's awful. It is awful. It is awful. Everyone in Congress should be ashamed of themselves. It is terrible. I have to buy this no name cheap insulin from Walmart for $25. And again, I haven't seen an endocrinologist over a decade. But these people will keep telling you, oh, I did this and I was in the White House and I know Biden and the rest of it. But for the rest of us who hurt and are on the ground, you're not doing anything. It is, it is not clearly not enough. People don't have access to regular doctors. I, again, I can't remember the last time I saw a regular doctor, let alone my endocrinologist or an endocrinologist. So we have to fix it. That has to be fixed now because the middle class has had enough. Today's second topic will be housing. Councillor Khalil, we will be, you will be the first to answer this question. The global crisis in affordability of housing has gotten even worse in, in, with the loss of jobs over the pandemic. The effects can be seen both abroad and sadly here at home. What moves can we make both as a global community and nationally to close the gap between empty and affordable housing and the homeless? Council so the, yes, one of the things I would definitely work on is making sure that we could come up with some type of rep, rent subsidies and uh, rent cap uh, price caps. We really, um, housing has become too expensive for many people. Uh, and another thing I think we really need to do, at least in the United States, is really to be, again, expanding affordable housing and, there's, and not make it as if it's this terrible uh, scourge. Affordable housing is for everyone and it really helps communities. Globally, we need to really focus on corruption of, uh, you know, from, of governments and to call them out. Uh, there is no reason we should see this homelessness and despair in, uh, throughout the world. And I think we can use foreign aid to help with homelessness, but at the same time, we can sit back and say, uh, you need, we need to watch over that foreign aid. Another thing we can do both here and abroad is focus on helping uh, communities economically to uh, build up their economic base and to expand education. Thank you. State Representative Kenyatta. Yeah, thank you so much for, for bringing this up. And like so many of the to topics, I have real skin in the game on this. You know, I lived six different places by the time I graduated because graduated high school um, because my mom wasn't always able to afford the, the rent. I think there are a couple of things that we need to do. Um, the first is we have to really increase the amount of money that's going to HUD so that, you know, just in my city here in Philadelphia, we have 70,000 to 90,000 fewer affordable units than we need. They are not able to afford to even build them out in the way that they, that they want. And that's gonna mean more funding to HUD. The other thing that I've been focused on in Harrisburg is trying to keep people in their homes, especially during this pandemic. I have a bill with Representative Cephas, Representative Anna Murata, uh, out of Pittsburgh to make sure that every person who's possibly facing an eviction will actually have a lawyer so that people can stay in their homes, but we do need to work at the federal and local level to deal with this. Thank you. Congressman Malam. Uh, President Biden's Build Back Better bill is one of the most aggressive housing bills that we've had uh, in a generation. It had a record amount of money 
for the existing public housing stock, which hasn't really been rebuilt or paid for for about 25 years. Uh, a lot of money for the vouchers that are most useful for getting homeless people off the street and into a, a dwelling. Um, and then some longer term investments as well. So that's, that bill is a good example of the stakes of this race. Uh, it passed the House of Representatives with my vote. Uh, it is two votes short in the US Senate. So if you're concerned about housing, as are if you're concerned about health care and prescription drugs, they were all rolled up in this one bill. And by winning uh, this race, we could potentially change that. Uh, the last thing I'll just add is we, there is a supply problem when it comes to building um, owner-occupied homes, the kind of homes that build generational wealth for people and always have in the U.S. Uh, we need to change the tax credit structure to get more of those homes built in the areas where they're most needed. Eric Gerhardt. Well, building's uh, my forte. So uh, my ideas for this is uh, not just throw a whole bunch of money for vouchers and all that stuff. I mean, why isn't there an initiative for trade schools? We need skilled workers that can do the job and fix these houses up because we have plenty of houses. There's just in horrible disrepair all over the country. Uh, we need skilled workers to fix those up, maybe some subsidies for them to help get that done in states. I know New Jersey has some subsidies that they actually give you to fix up decrepit homes. Um, on top of that, the rest of this. Um, I was going over there because I can't hello. Lou Tapera. So there's not a civil civil bullet to cure homelessness. Uh, it's a systemic issue. Um, there's opioid addiction issues along with it. There's mental health issues. Uh, when I go out and feed the, the homeless people in Norristown and, and uh, Bridgeport, uh, a huge majority are veterans. Um, but we all talk about how we support the military, but we really don't. We just let them sleep on the street. And it's education along lines of what he just said. We have to get more kids into college or a trade school to break the cycle of despair. We need to invest more money in education. We need to pay our teachers more. We need more teachers, just like we need more cops and pay them better. But for education, we need, we're cutting school activities. And that's why one of the reasons why crime is so crazy. We're cutting sports programs, we're cutting the arts and, and music programs. And this just leads to more and more problems and despair and lack of hope. Lieutenant Governor. Hi, uh, I'm a, a former four-term mayor of, of Braddock, Pennsylvania, and I know this issue well. I'm proud to say that uh, during my time as, as mayor, we oversaw the construction of no fewer than three affordable housing projects within our borders. One was specifically targeted to families with, with children. Another was specifically targeted to seniors. Another one was specifically targeted to single adults as well too. So the entire spectrum of, of that. And it's really comes down to funding and the commitment. And that's what we demonstrated during my time. And I, it's an issue that I know and actually was very successful in implementing as well too. But there also is an element there of historical harm that deserves redress. Redlining and predatory lending practices were par for the course, you know, for, for a good part of the early last century. And we have to make sure that our housing stock is not redlined. And we have to make sure that there are appropriate mortgages and protections in place to prevent foreclosures in the future. Today's third topic will be the environment. The U.S. continues to be one of the only countries not to ratify many environmental international treaties, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, and the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas. How does this affect our standing in the global community, and how do you think we should take a more active role in the global community's effort to minimize the disastrous effects of climate change? And we're going to start with Representative Kenyatta. Thank you so much. I think this moment, we all know there is a climate emergency. And our country doesn't just lead with our power, we lead with our example, which is why it was important that President Biden got us back into the Paris the Climate Accords. It's why it's so important that the Senate is able to finish the job on the Build Back Better agenda which will have historic investments in terms of moving us to a cleaner 
greener future. It's why I've been consistent in saying that we need to wean ourselves off quickly, aggressively from our dependence on fossil fuels and double down and invest on clean energy tech technologies, wind, solar, bio, geothermal. I think there's even a space for nuclear. The United States is not alone in terms of the carbon, methane that we emit. We're gonna have to rally the world and we rally the world by showing we're serious about this. Congressman Lamb. Yeah, I'll basically just pick up where Malcolm left off. I agree that um, we need to be thinking of climate as job one. Uh, the United States share of global emissions is only about 15%. And so uh, we could do everything perfectly in our country, get completely to zero or even negative emissions, uh, I'd still be in trouble as a world long term if, if China and India and all these, uh, the EU, all these big emitters don't do their job too. Uh, so part of it is diplomacy. You, you mentioned a couple of specific treaties. Uh, there are politics behind each one, and I think it's important that we not join treaties that uh, we don't believe we can comply with because that would make us look hypocritical. But I think on Paris, we have an excellent opportunity to lead by showing with a bill like Build Back Better uh, that we are willing to aggressively reduce our emissions and invest in new technologies. That's really what that bill uh, and the other bill we have coming up on competition and innovation with China uh, is to show we're going to be the technological leaders of the world again. Just like we won the race to nuclear energy and the space race, we're going to win the race here. Uh, and then we're going to share that technology with the rest of the world so that we can all meet our goals together. Mr. Gerhardt. Uh, I feel Build Back Better is putting the cart before the horse again. We, can't, we don't have the infrastructure built. And they say they need to pass this to get the infrastructure. But we could always build the infrastructure. There's going to be many hiccups. Most of the battery cells and such and the chip shortage is still a decade away. We need energy independence and a viable solution for our energy because batteries and stuff, they, they, they fail, they go bad, they're toxic. The technology is not up to the par where this grand idea is ready to be implemented yet. It still needs to be researched. Um, I'm not saying look at, not look into it and get it done, but we still need something we could count on. And right now, oil and gases and stuff, which are leaps and bounds cleaner than what they used to be decades ago, should still be viable until the infrastructure is done, built, and ready, and then we can have that battle on going completely here. Mr. Tapir. So it's a disgrace how we treat this planet. Um, I don't have any kids. My brother has six, though. And when they're my age, I don't know what this planet's going to look like, the way we're treating it. We treat it like a trash can. Um, we need re renewable energy, clean energy is the wave of the future. Either we develop it here, the kids from the University of Pitt come up with the, with the program, the Sal Villanova, these smart kids in these colleges need to make the new, the new technology, or as usual, we will become somebody else's customer and we'll, we'll, we will buy it from Canada. Uh, so we have to do it here. We have the farmland here in Pennsylvania not only to feed the homeless people, but we can build the, work, the, the, the wind turbines. We can make solar power grids. We can do this. It's gonna happen. So either we create it or somebody, China or India will create it. And then they just, they just get all our, all our money. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor. I, yeah. I, my family and I live across the street from uh, the steel mill in, in town in Braddock. And uh, back in 2009, uh, I was invited by the Obama administration and the Environmental Defense Fund to kind of be the face of, of this idea to push cap and trade legislation to do just that, to address carbon output in our economy and reject the false choice that you have to choose between jobs or a, a cleaner environment. And let me be clear, I want that steel mill to be in place there for the next 100 years. We can't offshore and outsource everything to China. We got to make stuff here in this country, but we have to do it in a way that's economically and environmentally sustainable. We as Democrats need to commit to the transition to a clean, green energy economy, but we also have to be mindful of making sure we take care and honor the jobs and the energy sector and the communities that depend on it. I've never taken a dime from the extractive industries. Climate change is a global emergency, but we have to do it in a methodical, 
way that's consistent with our approach in science. Councilor Khalil. I want to compliment all my uh, colleagues here today uh, for adopting much of my platform. I want to tell you environmental stewardship is really what leads and Pennsylvania really needs to be a leader in that we have so much to clean up in Pennsylvania and so much Pennsylvania could do to lead the world in technology, in particular in geothermal and in, um, and in other technologies. But I wanna point out that what's really important, why Build Back Better is important is because it deals with trade policy and industry policy. This is the first time in which we have a president who says we're gonna have a carrot and stick approach in which we sit back and we make things here in the United States. Um, my good friend Lou here is correct when he says that, yeah, we can't make everything abroad. And that is the case with the current state of uh, alternative energies. Almost all of it is made abroad. So why Build Back Better is important is that it would benefit, it would give uh, carrots to companies who built solar, who made solar powers, solar cells. Thank you here. Thank you. Today's third topic is immigration. Congressman Lamb, I'll ask you to go first. Out of the more than 26 million refugees in the world, less than 1% are considered for a settlement worldwide. The Trump administration decreased the admitted number of refugees considerably over his term to 15,000. And President Biden mm -hmm. has just raised it again with a goal of allowing in 62,500 refugees in the two, uh, 2021 fiscal year. Both of these numbers are well below the previous years, which were capped at 95,000, despite the many global conflicts that are producing more and more refugees. Do we increase our cap to the IRC's suggested 200,000 in 2022? Or is the US stretching itself too far with that large of a number? Um, I do think we need to increase the cap. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I could tell you sitting here right now what the right number is, and it's not the kind of thing you'd want to pick out of the air. The right number is one that we can get agreement on in Washington and sustain over a generation so that it's predictable. Um, I also think this needs to be paired with a broader immigration policy that actually allows people to apply for visas that want to come and work in this country and come in here and work legally. So some people may be resettled here as refugees. Uh, others may be the people that are that are showing up at our borders for a number of reasons and currently trying to take advantage of the broken asylum system to stay here for a couple of years and never know what's going to become of them. Uh, but if we increase the number of uh, visas for agricultural workers and seasonal workers and just recognize the fact that our economy is demanding the labor of these people and that our values require that we bring them out of the shadows, legalize them. Uh, allow them to, you know, live and produce. Uh, we will be a stronger economy. We'll have stronger Social Security and Medicare programs, and obviously, it's much more humane as well. Mr. Gerkar? Uh technology is a beautiful thing. With uh, new technologies, you can come up with all kinds of different ideas. One of my ideas was using a palm scan for people all over the different countries that they scan their hand, and that's their pass in. Now, how do you make that happen? is we sell internet to say Mexico and all the, the lower states and countries down there that have less access. We partner with them economically through this sale and make new connections a way to get up here. I mean, the whole thing everybody's worried about with immigration is the danger, the drugs, the trafficking of humans. If you can make it more of a safe and it has to be that person type way of getting across the border and says, this is just who you say you are. I think the whole system can be alleviated. And then when you streamline that process, you could easily up that number to whatever you want once you correct that issue. Mr. Tepere. So when it comes to the anti-immigration uh, talk on, on the Hill, one of my favorite movies is The American President. And there's a line that Michael Douglas has, and he says, um, they give you somebody to be afraid of and who does, who's to blame for it, and that's how you win elections. So the question that nobody asks is, why are these people trying to get in? And the bottom line is because we hire them. So people have to look in the mirror before they say, hey, let's stop all these illegal crossings. But you're the one who are hiring them as the, 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 the orange picker, the, your landscaper. 
So first off, we should allow people into this country. That's what America was built on. My dad came from Zimbabwe. You should be allowed to come to this America, come to America, become a legal citizen, and come work and pay your taxes. Lieutenant Governor, our campaign has always been uh, Amer immigration makes America America, and my my views have been reinforced and enriched by the fact that you know my wife and the mother of our children is a former dreamer, and her family came to this country when she was seven years old, fleeing a violent and dangerous situation. So. The, the plight of refugees and, and, and immigrants and undocumented is very near and dear. In fact, it's very part of the DNA of, of, of our family. And yes, I do believe we need to raise that limit. That's the very best of the American experience. It says so in the Statue of Liberty, send your tired huddled masses. And that's what I ran on in 2016 when it wasn't popular. And I'm running on that again in 2022. And the last occupant of the White House, won't name him. There's things that I just could never have supported like uh, his border wall or the, the Muslim ban. I mean, we're never more un-American when we are persecuting or questioning the Americanness of, of others. And immigration, as I said, makes America, America. Thank you, Councillor uh, Khalil? Khalil. Yes, I am the daughter, granddaughter, niece uh, of, of immigrants. I'm proud of my immigrant heritage, my Palestinian heritage. Uh, and I want to say your question was about letting uh, immigrants in. Yes, I think we need to, I'm sorry, refugees in, yes. But I think we have to stop our discrimina discriminatory policy towards uh, refugees. Uh, you know, right now, uh, the de deplorable, the deplorable treatment of Haitian refugees. I, I demand that and I ask that every one of my colleagues here speak out about the deplorable treatment. Uh, so yes, we need to make sure that our refugee policy is not discriminatory and that when our refugees come to the United States or the undocumented uh, ones, that we speak out if they're victims of violence. We speak out when their uh, businesses are robbed. We know we're seeing this in Philadelphia and I am one, and the only Democrat here who sat with our, uh, our immigrant communities when they were being robbed. Uh, it's, it's really disgraceful. And so I want to tell the immigrant community and refugees that you have a friend here, an ally. State Representative Kenyatta. You know, I, I said before that one of the most powerful things America has is our example. This is a moment where it's crystal clear the threshold is too low. But what we also need is comprehensive immigration reform. You know, Infrastructure Week became the butt of a joke. Immigration reform has been another issue that Washington has talked about over and over and over again. So many fits and starts, but we need to get it done. There are so many folks who've known no other home than this one, brought here as kids. Those dreamers need to absolutely be treated like the Americans that they are. We absolutely need a pathway of to citizenship for folks who are currently undocumented. And we also need to continue to stand against the cynical ploy of pitting refugees and immigrants against everyday Americans. It's why you had the former guy trying to build walls. And unfortunately, you had some Democrats who were willing to support him. I would never do that. And I'd be a vote to get immigration Thank reform you. done. In Pennsylvania, there are over 180,000 undocumented residents that reside within the Commonwealth. In addition, nearly 11 million live in our communities across the country. Pathway to citizenship has been an issue in this country for decades. What is your stance on a pathway to citizenship? And please explain your position as to whether you support it or are against it. Mr. Gerhardt. Citizenship, uh, being a citizen, I think everybody should pay their fair share from the beginning. There's a tax allowance for seven years that they don't have to pay when they come in. And they just use this as a loophole to hand off a business that's already established to another person. That's why you see people who come here and they own 75 Dunkin' Donuts, and Hess's, and Chuck E. Cheese, and this, that, and the other thing. And they just monopolize the system. Um, if you pay your fair share up front, you want to be here. And then, when you get the benefits, you're already paying into something you're receiving. So you're not increasing the welfare state even farther, the more you bring in. There has to be a balance of this uh, and taking advantage of it, it's, it's detrimental to the country and to the people who do their damn best. 
to pay their taxes and be a citizen of this country. Mr. Tapira? I'm, I'm all in favor uh, to make, not only make them citizens, but make them citizens faster than how we're doing it so they can pay taxes. You know, I've worked retail my entire life. This is my 33rd Black Friday. You know how many workers I've had to turn down because they don't have any paperwork? Um, and that's a, a lost worker that could have made my companies more money. And they, the, the state and the government could be making revenue off their, their income and their purchases. So we should absolutely make it uh, easier and a priority to legalize all these, all these uh, people from other countries and you know, get them into the system so they can go vote and go get a job. And that's, I, I don't understand a, a lay person on what, why it takes so long, but I'm sure somebody here will, will tell me that, but you know, we have to vet them and two, three, four years max, you should be a citizen and take your citizenship test. Lieutenant Government. Yeah, uh, again, it's, it's an issue that I uh, know well because of my family's uh, origin story and, and the circumstances. And absolutely, there should be a, a clear uh, path to citizenship for those uh, individuals living in, in our country. If they're living their best lives and they're making a positive impact in our communities, which the overwhelming majority of them are, they're here just building their lives and, and, and seeking uh, a better life for their family, just like my wife's uh, family did. Uh, again, you know, we need, their, we need their population growth. We need them in the labor force. We need them to add to the expanding American democratic experience. And immigration has in measurably enriched my life as it has our, our country's destiny and our country's potential. So uh, in terms of making sure that that process is as fair and as rapid and as uh, uh, secure as possible, you know, immigration makes America, America. Councilor Khalil. Oh, definitely. I would definitely support the Dreamers Act or, and, um, and a quicker path to citizenship. I uh, cannot stress enough, I am a daughter of immigrants. My family, I am the immigrant experience through my parents, through my family. Uh, and it's not enough just for us to say, hey, I support immigrants. I want to really be very clear that what we're seeing is discrimination in, in, in our immigration policy. We want these people, but not these people. We don't want the darker type of people. We want the very fair haired hair type people. Uh, we, uh, and that's just a uh, fact. We brutalize people at the border and no one says a word. So I really want to say that, yes, I believe and support a path to citizenship. I also think it's a great idea that when uh, we have immigrants come in and have money to open businesses. I met a gentleman up in Clarion County who has a pizza business who was on the path to citizen, I mean, to uh, residency. He opened a pizza shop. Have you been to Clarion County? They are I mean, losing you. businesses. Thank, Thank you. State Rep. Well, you know, I, as I said before, hell, hell yes. <laughs> and my, my answer is the same. The question is, we have to get it done now. This is who we are as a country. The unique and powerful thing about this nation is that unless you are native to this land, we're all immigrants to this country. And continuing to make sure that our story that our American story, that we welcome people from all across the globe, people who wanna come here to start a new life, to have a better life, people who have no choice but to come because they're fleeing violence where they are, this is who we are. But now it is our moment to actually get comprehensive immigration reform done, to make sure that we treat our neighbors with a level of dignity and respect and welcome them to be a part of this country, not just so that they can pay taxes, but so they can be the next chapter in the American dream. Thank you. Congressman Lamb. I know we have some folks from Casa San Jose on the call, and I've, I've shared with you before that the same neighborhood where Casa San Jose operates today, Beachview, uh, is where my great grandfather landed when he came from Ireland as a, a teenager and a blacksmith. Uh, and for three generations, our family grew and prospered in that same neighborhood where you all are starting your lives in America. Uh, and I agree, there, the difference in between how those two sets of families are treated has a lot to do with discrimination. Uh, and we do need to have a path to citizenship for 
not just the dreamers and the TPS holders, which of course we need and I have voted for before, but uh, you use the number 11 million. I think it's closer to 20 million people that are living in the shadows in this country, obeying the law, paying their taxes, and of, of relevance to Pennsylvania, paying into Social Security and Medicare programs that they will never collect if we don't make this change, but will support all of the elderly people in our state. It's very important that we incorporate these people into our society legally. There's nowhere else that they're going to go. I have voted that before and, and we'll vote that way again. Thank you. The next questions are about international and global affairs questions. Uh, Lou Tapera, I'll ask you to go first. After the U.S. pulls out of countries such as Afghanistan and Syria, are we still obliged to provide fungible foreign aid? How much obligation does the U.S. have in relation to foreign aid to other countries in regards to our current involvement? Should we provide more or less? For most countries, we should, it's, it's on a country by country basis, but for most countries, we should at least maintain it, if not give, give more. Uh, these countries who are distressed are next to our allies and the dominoes just fall in the other direction. And it's the moral and the human thing to do to make sure kids not only here in Pennsylvania and America, but they get to school and they get an education. So that helps the human race. There's people in most countries, even here in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh who are starving and can't eat. So we have a moral obligation to help everybody. I know there's a fixed amount of resources that we have in America. We can't just pay everybody money, but it's the right thing to do is to at least teach people how to fish and, and help third world nations and nations that are struggling. Lieutenant Governor. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's often misconceptions and, and the misconceptions are exploited by those that have, um, you know, malintent. The truth is, the United States spends roughly 1% of its, of its budget on, on foreign aid. So, so but it, it's also critical that we invest it in, in countries that we have a duty and obligation to be uh, stewards of those that we were involved in or we had, had occupied, of course. But we also have to be mindful of the kind of investments countries like China are making in their belt and road program where those, they're making you know, interest debt traps uh, for all these countries. And those value of those projects now has reached $4 trillion in terms of using that as a competitive advantage to, uh, to ensnare these countries and build their influence globally as well too. We must be strategic with our foreign aid. We must be targeted with our foreign aid. We must make sure it's not uh, open for fraud or to be used to, to fund terrorism or, or other illegal activity. But we also must be strategic, especially with China in mind with their Belt and Road Program. Council Kalu. I want to piggyback on what the Lieutenant Governor said, and I agree with much of what he said. I do want to point out that in my conversations of constituents across, across the state, in particular immigrants, a big focus and concern is cronyism in our, in our foreign aid program, that they would like to see money really targeted towards more local businesses, that that is how our funds get spent of, through our, our foreign aid. I do agree that we need to, help with schools. I don't like the word steward, uh, I, I should tell you. I think uh, when you invade a country, you're not their steward, you're their occupier. Uh, but, uh, so, um, but I think it's very important that we are very careful with how we give a foreign aid, that we need to watch out for corruption. And this is a big uh, ask of immigrant communities uh, that I've spoken to. So yes, we should have foreign aid, but we really need to have better oversight and focus more on economic development locally. State so, you know, it was already mentioned that we actually spend a de minimis amount on foreign aid, but that aid is an important part of our diplomatic toolkit. We are seeing right now USAID in Poland assisting with the relocation of refugees from the crisis in Ukraine. And we have seen our aid be a tool to stabilize countries in Central America where the vice president has visited extensively to try to say, how can we help folks who are fleeing not have to flee the home in the neighborhood that they love? And if we can provide aid, that can help to stem uh, you know, further crises um, as it relates to the prior topics we were discussing. And so this is one of the tools in our bellywick and it's an important tool. 
And we cannot allow nativism and anti-immigrant fervor to take this tool out of our belly with. We need it now more than ever. Congressman Lamb. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I mean, I, I think it's important for people to realize that uh, most of our foreign aid goes to countries like um, Jordan and Afghanistan and Egypt, where we have a, a whole set of interests at play and we're doing things like trying to counter um, you know, Islamic terrorist movements in those countries by providing alternatives. Uh, and so again, with the long term struggle, the framework to think about problems like this is our contest with China, uh, autocracy versus democracy basically. And Russia is on the side of China and Europe is for the most part on the side of the United States. And so as we work together, the EU and the United States using not only foreign aid, but things like sharing new forms of technology, moving our troops around, having trade agreements, opening our markets to them and theirs to us, uh, we have a chance to establish a whole network of relationships that enlarges the space for democracy and human rights in the world. Mr. Gerhardt. Foreign aid's always going to be needed. There's always going to be somebody who needs it. And we've already set that money aside that, so that we can distribute it as it needed. Afghanistan, I mean, we left. They found, I don't know, what, 10, 15 trillion dollars worth of raw materials under the ground. China swooped right in and guess what? They're gonna strip mine it and the country's gonna be richer than anything. They won't need our aid. We should be building partnerships through business with other countries to build their infrastructure up and partnering with them so that we make money too. So they don't need us as much and we can focus on America first. Thank you. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We will be taking a short 10 minute break and we'll be back to resume our public question section. Please take this opportunity to submit questions if you have any in the comment section of the World Affairs Council Facebook page or Casa San Jose's Facebook page. Thank you and we see you shortly. COVID-19 exposed our current system for being inequitable, inefficient, unhealthy and unjust. It has impacted everyone, but women, especially women of color, are bearing a much bigger burden. Women are four times more likely than men to have lost work since the pandemic began. They're more likely to be low wage frontline workers at greater risk of catching the virus, yet without access to paid family or medical leave. As the US is the only developed nation in the world without guaranteed paid sick days or paid family and medical leave, how do you think increasing access to paid leave can help employers recruit and retain workers and complete globally? And if you were elected to the Senate, would you champion these kinds of policies to strengthen the economic security of working families? Paid, paid working leave. That's just a, a fundamental basic right that we should uh, afford uh, every American family. And you know, during the pandemic, I was proud to have chaired the, the, the commission on the, the response to just the, the racial disparities that the COVID pandemic uh, highlighted and exacerbated here, whether it's education, whether it's health outcomes, whether it's access to rental assistance, whether it's access to hospitalization. And it's fundamentally true that the pandemic didn't, didn't create it, it just simply amplified it and revealed it in, in very ugly terms. And we as a, as a nation and we as a commonwealth have to move towards a more inclusive and fair health, health come outcome, uh, healthcare outcome in, in our country. And as I alluded to earlier, the, the black mortality uh, uh, rate, uh, uh, maternity rate is, is, is a disgrace. You know, we have to close that and address that and also close the enormous wage gap between women of color and, and white men. Councilor Kalil. Yes from, yes, from day one, I would support and be a champion for those very policies. They are very much why I support Build Back Better because it does talk about family paid leave and others, but it is very and vitally important. And we are not a leader in, in the globe, uh, across globally. In fact, all of our European allies have, have a family paid leave. But I think we really need to also sit back and further subsidize and provide better subsidies Hell, uh, education should be paid for from, from pre-K 
to through college. So I think that's extremely important, but a really important point is bringing people to the table. In Philadelphia, for example, they had some kid right out of Drexel talking about distributing of COVID. When we had a highly amazing doctor, Dr. Alice Stanford, who really herself went off and started helping um, uh, African-American communities get COVID vaccines and tested. They went to some, you know, these harebrained schemes when we have Thank great you. Thank you. you know what, let me, let me just say this as plainly as I possibly can. The fact that we do not have universal paid leave in this country is a damn disgrace. Every single one of us knows it. And I have been absolutely outspoken in standing up for frontline workers who moved this country, allowed this country to continue to move and operate when folks had to show up to jobs where they did not know whether or not they would get infected. And that's why I'm so grateful to be endorsed by so many frontline workers, including SEIU, including District Council 33, including so many others who've placed trust in me and in this campaign to go to Washington and fight for them, but also fight for the people that I love best, who have gotten the raw end of the stick. My neighborhood was absolutely crushed by this pandemic. It's why I stepped up to help folks get testing and to work with folks like Dr. Sanford, who is incredible to also get folks vaccines as well. Eric, go ahead. I have many ideas on how to help people with all the things that they need, pay leave, this, that, and the other thing. I mean, taxes, if you keep charging people taxes, they lose money. Then they can't pay for the stuff they need. So why not give more of a little bit of a tax break to companies, start off right there, raise the GDP, country gets more money, everybody has more money in their pocket. On top of that, you add in an, a caveat to the bill where if the companies offer that thing like paid leave, paid maternity leave, they get another little tax break so the business does better, the people do better. And that's one way that you get your unions to give all the benefits that the people in the unions used to have that's been just going away astronomically from decades ago. I mean, we had these things in place. It's we're moving away from it and moving toward the big business is capitalizing on the small employee and they don't get the benefits. We need to go back the other way around where the employee is the one that you need to value. Let's go. So the short answer is yes. Um, we, you know, in, in retail, you know, my friends who work at Target, $15 an hour isn't enough. They still can't, they still went through this Christmas uh, with stores half empty of associates lines were all crazy. Um, but so yes, that should be part of the benefit package. And I think we can be on the forefront of that. Uh, quick side note, um, you know, I see a lot of candidates for all offices um, knocking labor. Uh, so my mom was a union steward for the CWA. And we have, we talked about sick days and personal time and vacation, but that was because of the labor movement who took bricks and bats to the head. So uh, people need to show the unions and labor a little bit more respect. And, um, but that's it, thank you. Next question is climate change related question and Councilor Kalu, I ask, I'll ask you to go first. But I also would like to remind everyone that this is a forum where you are invited to provide rebuttals. You have 30 seconds per question to, uh, to offer your rebuttal. The question is, how would you discourage the proliferation of coal-fired power plants in developing countries? I would discourage them by offering them alternative energies or telling them that they could use um, turn them into batteries uh, for storage. However, I would sit back and say at this current state, I don't think it's fair for countries that are very poor to tell them not to go use to coal. I think that we need to sit back, we at the US need to set an example and poor countries are gonna have to, you know, deal with their burdens. And I, and I do not feel comfortable to go tell a poor country that no, you must stop using coal. I would say though, that I would try to sell them our gas. I would try to try to sell them our uh, solar panels, our wind generators. 
and our hydro and our hydrogen technology, God willing, which will be soon, and our um, geothermal system technology. I uh, think that one of the things as someone has pro pro uh, talked about earlier is that um, we can't destroy people's economy and then not think that they're going to want to come flee and find a safe haven somewhere else. So as we move forward, uh, we have to think about globally how we would reimburse them if we're going to ask them. Yes. Uh, all right, the next one is State Rep. Kenyatta. Oh, thank you. Um, you've, you've heard me now, this will be my third time saying it, but I think it's so important. The power of our example matters, it matters. Us being put in a position where we move away from incentivizing these things here at home through tax breaks and subsidies for, for all the folks involved in these dirty industries and actually reinvest those money into the things that I've mentioned in a previous question about wind, solar, bio, geothermal. This puts us in a position where we can become a net exporter of these technologies that put us all in a position where we can continue to share this planet for the foreseeable future. I mentioned it once before. America, in terms of our carbon output, it's not just us. We have a whole globe. We have to be able to rally the globe the way we did with the, the Paris Climate Accords. And those have real targets in it, but it's also gonna be on us leading and having that technology be able to send to those developing nations. Thank you, Mr. Gerhard. Coal fired uh, power plants are pretty much uh, based on the steam engine. Um, most of our power plants are mostly based on the steam engine. Even like uh, the, the hydroelectric turbines are pretty much the same thing. You're using some kind of force to turn to generate electricity. Um, like I said, it's a little more cart before the horse. We don't have the technology yet to really move forward to get away from something that's completely green. Now, solar panels are great. We could put an investment in that. It should always belong to the people. I do have a plan for that as well, where you donate the panels to every child born of that year. Say, I think it's like 7.5 or seven and a half million children. You say, and it costs about 30 billion to install those panels. You do that for 10 years. You also get initiatives where you have children through the school make the design up for their states and the states choose the design of how you want to lay these panels out. Make it a, a group effort and actually move to something that you can actually We're help time. everybody. So yes, we should help them. I mean, information is the most powerful commodity on earth. So for these countries who are still in old age um, energy production systems, we should help them. Uh, they, we need to educate them. We need to help them build a stronger, safer, healthier earth. We need to start that here, but we should definitely be doing it in other countries that maybe don't have all these fantastic universities that we have and, and, and know how, but we're all, this is the only planet we got. You know, it's not like you know, rich people live on Mars and the rest of us are down here. So we have to take better care of this earth and one way through, through that and create fantastic jobs, usually union jobs is clean energy, but we have to show these other nations how, how to do it and help them develop it. Lieutenant Governor. The truth of the matter is that uh, there are a lot of countries that uh, are betting on coal and they're investing in coal energy. And there are countries like Japan or China or Indonesia. I mean, these nations, especially in Japan after the Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster with uh, the tsunami, that committed to building, I believe, over 20 coal plants, coal fire plants, to replace the energy that they lost after the disaster. So the truth of the matter is. A lot of you know, countries that say uh, aren't, don't need our help, don't need our advice, or, or investing in coal to, to the planet's detriment, I, I might add. So you know, I think it's incumbent on us to get our own house in order when it comes to that and make sure that we transition to, to green energy and we do it as rapidly as we can and make sure that the, inner, the, the communities that are being left behind by that transition are taken care of and that workers are, are respected and found alternative careers. But furthermore, it's about making sure that we remain in the Paris climate accord and we act as a global leader. Thank you. 
Please address the expansion of presidential power to begin and end wars. For example, why was the president able to withdraw from Afghanistan without congressional approval or oversight? And this will go first to State Representative Kenyatta. Well, certainly I think the US Congress has given up too much of its rightful constitutional authority to determine when and how, well not how, but when and where, um, military, American military might is used. And there are multiple examples of where this has gone awry. I think the very broad um, authorization of military force as it related to the war on terror has meant that multiple presidents, Republicans and Democrats, have been able to, with very little oversight, declare folks enemy combatants and use drones and other uh, aspects of our military power to be involved in theaters of combat all around the world. If folks in our armed services are brave enough to go to these theaters, members of Congress ought to be brave enough to say whether or not they should be there. Eric Gerhardt. Um, the emergency powers that they give to themselves is exactly in the emergency powers provision, which once they declare an emergency, pretty much Congress gets waved out of the way and the president can make as many decisions as he wants, which can just go right to dictatorship. Um, it should always be decided by the body because one man's decision could, has the effect on everybody. Um, with like attacking people and stuff, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a pacifist. I am a libertarian, so we follow the NAP, which is the non-aggression principle, meaning we don't hit first, but we don't let it just fly like that. We will hit back. That's kind of pretty much how America should roll. Um, and that's all I guess. So CNN, who never interviews me, uh, you know, they say every every other minute before they go to commercial break, you know, um, elections matter. That's a power the president has. So he's entrusted with our our faith and trust that if he needs to go to war, he can go to war. Now, should we go through Congress? That would be nice, but that's not always going to happen. If Russia starts nukes Alaska right now, we don't have time to go through Congress to have President Biden take action. So, you know, there's different case scenarios. If you wanna go with a war with XYZ country, okay, maybe you can do that. It, you know, there's an economic thing or whatever. You know, the professional courtesy is you would go through Congress, but things happen yesterday in this world now. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a time issue. Lieutenant Governor? Uh, it, it's imperative that the, the commander in chief have the flexibility to act swiftly should there be uh, a national emergency regarding our, our military uh, and our security. But at the same time, that power cannot and should not go unchecked and Congress should never cede that power unilaterally over over to the president, despite being the, the, the commander in chief. What happens most of the time is, is these forever wars that our country had gotten caught up in, whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan. And this ability, um, you know, I would have supported the withdrawal from Iraq and Afghanistan years earlier. And that's a power that should be vested solely, in my opinion, uh, by Congress, because you know, the, the simple fact of the matter is that, that we can't invest our blood and treasure uh, indefinitely in, in any of these forever wars. And the, the appropriate level of check and balance for a national emergency that the commander in chief has must be reined in by the long-term perspective Councilor by Glenn. Congress. Uh, Congress has the sole authority to enact legislation and to declare war. So I just wanted to make that clear to everyone. That is our job to declare war. And I hope to God that, um, that when, you know, that I would be a, a uh, Barbara Lee when it need be if it, for a bad decision about war and, and to say no when it, it's warranted. Uh, but having said that, I support President Biden and President Trump's decision to withdraw from Afghanistan. Forever wars have to stop. 
We've lost trillions of dollars in, and thousands of men and women and millions of Iraqis, and we still are in Iraq, and millions of, of uh, Afghanistan, uh, Afghanis over these endless wars. We have to stop these endless wars. I don't have to agree with the Lieutenant Governor on that. But I do have to tell my colleagues, we as in Congress, we declare war and we need to really think about that when, we, when the time comes. Uh, and so I would hope that we, uh, when needed, we would not be afraid to be a Barbara Lee and say no. And when needed, we would say yes as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. If, Bear. If I have an opportunity as well. Can we still rebut? Yep. I would just say, I heard a comment made that it's a professional courtesy. The constitution is not a professional courtesy. We have something called the War Powers Act that says within 48 hours, the president can respond in an emergency, but within 48 hours, Congress needs to be notified of any actions that were taken. And our troops cannot, without an authorization of military force um, within 60 days, be somewhere that it was not approved for them to be. The legislature has completely dropped the ball. I voted for President Biden. I worked hard for him. But this has to be for every president, Democrat or Republican. Thank you. I, I would like to rebut. I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. I, no, you can go first. No, I just wanted to point out, I think the question was, did, should he have had authorization to bring people home? Is that, is that correct? If that's correct, I think we needed to bring him, uh, our troops home. Uh, because our Congress currently, both at the House and at the Senate, are just so divided and really, I think, did not care that we had these endless wars. And here we had its rare moment of bipartisanship. You may not like President Trump. You may not like uh, President Biden, whoever you are. But both made the right decision to bring our troops home. I'm so sorry about the cost of death. I, I feel for the families who, of the soldiers right. lost. I feel for the- yeah, The time for a battle is over. Thank you. Anybody else wanted to rebut? Yeah, I had something Mr. I wanted Hart. to say. Here in Pennsylvania, we voted on May 18th to take Governor Wolf's emergency of powers away because he was obviously using them too much, masking everybody, making everybody get vaccinated. It should always be personal choice of everyone to what goes in and how you handle your own health. Um, emergency powers are used in the same way with the president. He's doing things that he feels are right but may not be right in the long run. Our, our next question is about nuclear power and nuclear arms. Um, Mr. Gerhardt, this is the first one. Uh, you will go first. Please speak to the threat of a nuclear armed Iran and North Korea. How should the US minimize the effects of these threats? Um, well, obviously not going back into the Iran deal, seeing as they only have an option of where they want to you get on nuclear weapons and they're not going to use it just for energy. Um, they will use it maliciously, same thing as North Korea. Now these are impoverished countries. Like I said before, if we build networks of helping them build their infrastructure and their economies, we don't have to worry about war because they can take care of themselves. They're in squalor and, and destitute situations where they don't have the supply chains that we have all over. And if we could address those issues, we could live peacefully together. And I think that's the way we should go. Lou Tepere. So I do believe in the Iran nuclear deal. And, you know, that said, we can't, you know, for those who don't like it when we get in other people's affairs, that's a, that's a fair argument. Like, who are we to tell I'm just making a scenario up. Australia, they can't have nuclear submarines, for example. Um, so, you know, we, we're not the police of the planet, uh, which is an old adage, I know. But, you know, countries are going, more and more countries are going to go online. And it's funny, we talk tough about certain countries, but North Korea allegedly has nuclear weapons. I mean, I feel they do. Um, but it's not like we, we're going to invade them or start a war with them. So, but we're letting them do it. But we want to talk about other countries who want to develop nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. It's, you know, so. Lieutenant Governor. The truth of the matter is rogue states like North Korea or Iran make the world a, left, a less safe place, especially if they secure uh, the ability to produce nuclear weapons. North Korea, for example, 
uh, is, is it's impossible to to figure out to know exactly what's going on and and there there can't really be any level of of uh, verification on what what they're doing other than to to cause chaos and to uh, achieve nuclear status just because they would perceive to be taken more seriously in the in the global community i strenuously oppose president trump's approach and calling him rocket man and, and behaving in a reckless manner towards north korea i think Barack obama did an outstanding job in engagement and containment iran the, I support President Biden getting back into the, the deal. I think President Trump made a mistake by removing us from the Iran uh, nuclear deal. Longer and stronger in terms of what I believe, and Iran should not be allowed to acquire nuclear weapons. But at the end of the day, it must be done on a trust but verify basis. Councillor Khalil? I have to say that I agree with my colleague, uh, Lou. Uh, and uh, that, you know, we are not the police of the world and there are other countries that have nuclear weapons and uh, some countries are allowed to have them and some aren't. I support President Biden's return uh, to, the, uh, to the table with Iran about to discuss the nuclear weapons deal. And I supported President Obama's, but at the end of the day, you know, if uh, unless everyone is uh, under a, um, you know, uh, not permitted to have one. I, I don't see why we'd sit back and hold uh, certain countries uh, at a higher standard than others. I, I would sit back and say though that, uh, take a look, uh, I've just recently read that the Ukraine is regretting having given up its uh, nuclear arms. You know, Russia has them and now nuclear uh, Ukraine is sitting there saying, maybe the nuclear weapons were a deterrent. It's something to think about. It's something I would talk with my colleagues about and, uh, but uh, thank you. State Representative Kenyatta. A nuclear armed Iran is unacceptable. And what we've seen in North Korea, the instability of the current regime has made a nuclear North Korea incredibly dangerous. And there's been at least public reporting that they've begun to uh, do construction at a previously shut down nuclear site. And so nuclear proliferation is more important now than ever. It is pretty <clears throat> upsetting that the former president was able to unilaterally withdraw from the Iran deal when they were in compliance. That has made us less safe today. It was a big mistake for him to be exchanging love letters with Kim Jong-un at a time where we need to be having serious diplomacy, including South Korea and Japan and China, and so this is one of these issues where I'm lucky that we have President Biden in the Oval Office and not the last guy. Thank you. DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, took a firm position on NATO this past weekend, urging the US to withdraw and end imperialistic expansionism in air quotes. Do you agree with anti-NATO rhetoric and do you disavow their statement? And we're going to start with Lou Tucker. America should always be in NATO, period. That's, that's not even a discussion point with me and I think most people up here. Uh, we, need, we need our allies. We have to help Germany and France if they fall down and they're gonna have our back if somebody attacks us. So we must always stay in NATO. I don't even know where that even began when that, when that started. I've never heard of something that, that to me is actually nonsense uh, to, for America to withdraw from NATO. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor. Yeah, I, I would reject that in the strongest possible terms. Uh, NATO has been a key strategic alliance that has helped make Europe and in turn democracy and the free world more safe, more secure, and to, to prosper. We can't turn our back on it. In fact, and now we should be doubling down more and more. I mean, it's the same struggle, democracy versus authoritarian regimes like China or uh, the Soviet Union or Russia, whatever it is, the names change, but the battle still stays the same. And the NATO uh, alliance is one of the best tools that we have as a free society in the countries that are part of it to hold those kinds of regimes in check and to also promote and secure the spread of our core values of democracy and a free and open society and, and basic equality. So without a doubt, uh, NATO should be expanded and embraced and celebrated, especially in light of what's going on now in Ukraine. Councilor Khalil. 
No, I do not support us withdrawing from NATO. I think we should have a strong NATO. And I would like to say that this is a point where I actually agree with President Trump in this particular way. President Trump really attacked, uh, voiced his opposition or screaming at NATO, excuse me, that was the wrong term, uh, when he said that um, you need to spend more on military. And he was right. Germany and NATO needs need to spend more on their military. It should not be on the backs of the United States, our soldiers. They need to really invest more in NATO. And I have to agree with him on that. He was also right when he talked about the, uh, the, the pipeline, the German uh, Russian pipeline for their gas. That was totally a mistake. And, uh, you know, we may not like President Trump, uh, and I don't vote Republican, but every so often a broken clock is right. On those two instances, our NATO allies need to step up. They need to better provide their, uh, their military and not build a pipeline to gas for Russia. State Representative Kenyatta. The DSA is completely wrong, completely and utterly wrong. And they've been wrong on a number of other issues. Let me say this unequivocally, NATO has made this world a safer place and expanding NATO, looking at how, I know that Finland and other uh, Nordic countries are looking at joining NATO or at least talking about it more. I know Finland was just at the White House with the president talking about more close collaboration. This is a moment where if we didn't have NATO and Russia invaded, we would be in a much different position. But because of President Biden's leadership rallying the world, rallying our NATO allies, Vladimir Putin is going to be in a much weakened position politically, economically, and he's been very isolated from the world with some notable exceptions like China. But we need NATO now more than ever. Mr. Gerhardt? Uh, I'm not for pulling out of NATO. I'm not for expanding NATO. Uh, little facts is uh, George Bush, invaded Ukraine and led a coup to put a democratic president in there. And that was to get Ukraine to be NATO to expand it closer to Russia and China's borders. So you can't really say this was unprovoked that they attacked. They don't want anybody encroaching on their land. This is like, we don't want anybody encroaching on ours. If Ukraine by itself, without a coup by our country, could have stepped up and became part of NATO, that's a different story. They, they would have had the capability to do so, and they would have been brought in with no problem. The fact that we are going in as a country to other parts of countries, Somalia, Yemen, destabilizing these countries, and then trying to get them to be part of NATO, that's just bad business. And uh, yeah, I don't like condoning any of that. May I rebut something? Uh, um, yes. Uh, yes. It's, it's the United States actually that really has been leading NATO and is really taking the entire burden of NATO in terms of military spending. We spend an enormous $750 billion on our military uh, budget. And I, so when we sit back and talk about who is really protecting the world, it is really the United States with maybe some help from NATO. NATO needs to up its, uh, up its game. Uh, you should know that almost every European country and many in NATO helped fund the Nordic pipelines from Russia to Germany. And now they've stopped Thank you, it. Thank you. There, there's just, and there, there are a number of comments that have been made that have just been wrong and belayed a complete misunderstanding of what's happening right now. Putin was in no way justified in this unprovoked, barbaric war that he began and to continue to say that he is somehow justified because of the expansion of NATO is misinformation and disinformation that's pushed out on certain networks. And I think we should stop saying that and stop giving those very false comments a platform anywhere. Next question um, on TPS. What is your platform on expanding temporary protected status TPS to people from the countries on the TPS list, such as Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. Uh, John Ketterman. I, I strongly support it. And, and uh, also uh, uh, Sudan as well too on the list. Uh, I, I think it's critical that we extend the level of protection for those individuals who face certain harm, violence, or even death 
uh, if they uh, are sent back to their, their countries. I mean, that's the reality and that's why we should be extending this. There was a, it was a great quote, uh, humanitarianism doesn't become a value unless, until you act on it. And I think um, extending uh, TPS and making that a really vital tool uh, in, in uh, our process as we deal with, with refugees uh, and immigration, I think is, is critical and I fully support that. Councillor Kalu? Oh, I definitely support it. And I think I, I, vote, I have voiced uh, my support for the TPS and uh, refugees. I do again want to point out, I am the only US Senate candidate that voiced my outrage on the whippings of Haitian refugees on the border, on the deportation of Haitian refugees at the border. I have met with the Haitian community and voiced my support. So it's easy to come here in a forum like this and say, yes, I support, I support. But what do you really support when you see um, refugees being whipped? I demand those border policemen be fired. That's what I demand. And I demand that President Biden live, uh, we live to our values. How dare you whip a human being? Where, what, where are we? So yes, I support uh, TPS and I support uh, treat, uh, pop, proper treatment and humanitarian treatment of, our, of refugees at the border. State Representative Kenyatta. Well, the good thing in this race, there was not only one candidate who spoke out against what happened to Haitian immigrants on the, on the border. It was despicable, we all know it. And I'm happy that the president, the vice president, secretary of Homeland Security moved quickly to investigate this and to make sure that folks were involved or held accountable to the fullest extent of the law beyond just losing their job. I think it was criminal um, what was actually done. We understand, and I think it's been repeated now multiple times by me and others on this, on this forum, that yes, we need to be doing things around TPS. We need to do things um, as it relates to supporting dreamers. But these things happen when we do comprehensive immigration reform. As your Senator, I am committed to going to Washington and being a part of a group that gets to work and gets that done. And I know that we have a president that will be willing to sign that bill if we can get it done. And now is the time to do it. Mr. Gerhard. Um, I mean, the fact that everybody wants to say people were getting whipped and shit. I mean, that cop's still on the job. He didn't actually whip nobody. It was a riding crop. He had to turn the horse. It was in the general direction. It was just a caption, a picture. He didn't actually do anything wrong and it has been investigated and rebutted. So you guys just keep saying propaganda that's not actually true when really Biden opened up the border completely and unabettedly is actually what led to all the humanitarian issues and stuff like that without a plan. Not whatsoever. He just opened it up, free run, everybody can do whatever they want. And uh, that's not what you really do unless you want to call it chaos. And that's all I've seen from this president from day one pipeline shut down, Nord Stream 2 opened up. Why, why are we giving them access to oil when we're taking our oil away? Why are we undermining American citizens? Why we got to go all electric? Why are we doing this, that, and the other thing? Everything is hurting the American people. I'm sick of it. And I'm going to say, I'm going to tell everybody, I'm, I'm not sitting down being quiet. Okay. We're I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm going to have to rebut that. Uh, President sure. Biden has not uh, op uh, opened up the border, you know, uh, uh, nilly willy. On the contrary, he has had uh, sent back quite a few uh, immigrants, uh, refugees, perhaps more than any other president. Uh, so I, I would sit back and challenge you on that. Uh, and as far as the inhumane treatment of uh, Haitian refugees, that is documented. Uh, and also, there was rallies in Philadelphia, and not one Senate, U.S. Senate candidate but me was there. Uh, and so uh, I just wanted to tell you that what you're saying is totally wrong. Thank you. Mr. Tepper. Um, So yes, for me. Um, um, but for me, what's amazing, so I read five newspapers a day. And once in a while, if I have extra time, I will read the opinion section. And having watched all the cable news stations, yes, because I don't live in an echo chamber, I watch them all and I read liberal and conservative newspapers. Um, I'm stunned at when exactly at what point did we stop caring about each other. Um, it's, it's, it's scary, it's sad, it's a disgrace. It's, um, I know we're better than this, um, how people are, are okay 
with the people who make my, my iPhone get menial wage uh, wages. It's like, that's not okay. It's not okay. And there's still a lot of people here who look at the fight over Obamacare. Like people typed up and stormed, you know, with the Capitol to make sure I don't have, I don't get health care. Like, I don't care if you die. I have this, it's my perk, you don't have this. So let's keep it like that so I feel good about myself. Like at what point did we become this society? Thank you. Can I just say very, very quickly, and I think it probably goes without saying, but just for folks watching at home, basically everything Mr. Gerhardt said in his last response was wrong. I, I assume most people recognize that, but I thought it's worth mentioning. Which one was that? Did you answer the question? I'm sorry. Um, the next question. Given how deeply polarized the country has become prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, how do you see the prospect of both parties, Democrat and Republican and their constituents, along with independents and the general public, coming together given what's happening now? Is there anything the opposing party Democrats and the Republicans and vice versa, have gotten right with the respect to foreign policy. And we're starting with Councilor Khalil. I think uh, that, you know, you know, that I do think that the infrastructure bill, they have gotten right. I think that the American Rescue Plan, they've gotten right. Uh, there are some things I do not agree with on foreign policy. I'm very, very disappointed. And actually, I'm appalled as to the bombings in Gaza and the total lack of of any uh, outrage by uh, the president, the vice president and Congress. I, I think it was disgraceful. And it shows right now the double standard that we see in American foreign policy when it comes up to people, uh, to, to Middle Easterners, to Africans, to Caribbeans, to Hispanics, uh, they can be bombed, they can be uh, mistreated and really it doesn't get any, uh, any uh, no, no concern. In fact, on the contrary, we, we cheer on the, the, uh, the oppressor. I would sit back and say that I think it's wonderful that we are standing up to Putin. I think it's about time we need to stop occupation and we need to stop uh, brutal dictatorships. State Representative Pineda. So I think that we have to reject this false dichotomy that there are just two sides who can't get along. They're both equally to blame. My approach has been this. I don't join people on Fantasy Island. I'm not paddling over to join folks on Fantasy Island. But when my Republican colleagues have wanted to paddle over and join me in reality, always more than happy to greet them at the dock and work with them to get something done for regular people. And I've done that on issues from criminal justice reform, mental health care for our kids, and issues that certainly um, relate to foreign policy, hardening our digital infrastructure um, at, the, at the state level. Um, as it relates to foreign policy, I think that some Republicans, and I say some, who've spoken out against the brutal, senseless war that Putin has started in Ukraine, they are right to say that. But unfortunately, we still have the leader of the Republican Party saying that he's a genius and he's brilliant. And so on that, I completely disagree. Mr. Gerhardt. Uh, well, you know, let's go back to Biden shutting down their pipeline or giving them their pipeline and relieving some sanctions. Now, he didn't do that in the beginning. And I wanna know what he got for that. Cause if he didn't get anything for that, that's a bad trade from the beginning. He could have kept that and he could have used that in this conflict as something that you can have a pipeline, you don't start a conflict. As soon as you do, it's going away. He took his cards all out of his own hand and weakening your hand is not something any poker player ever does unless you're not playing for whatever side you're supposed to be playing for. So, um, I think I said enough on that already. Mr. Tapera. Um, I think this one issue is, these responses you just heard is why regular Americans who aren't rich and aren't on Capitol Hill are, are tired. And this is why more of people like me should be running for office, where everyone gets in their little trench and people like they're kindergartners and stop talking to the other person. 
people will hate on Mr. Fetterman here, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman here, or AOC. They will hate on McConnell, they will hate on Pelosi. And everybody gets in a little dugout and that's it. And that's not what an adult, that's not how an adult acts. So we have to get along or we're doomed. The state is doomed, this country, this planet is doomed if we don't at least talk to other people. And you know, the comments I just heard here, you know, just go along with the frustration uh, that us voters have that people will not, when I grew up, Reagan could get in an all out argument with you. You could go to the Oval Office, have a cigar and eat jelly beans. Like that's, and that's how deals were made and Biden's old school Lieutenant and does Governor. that. Yeah, I, I, if the question was a foreign policy uh, decision that was bipartisan that I agree with, well, I, I would say that President Biden's decision to uh, the Russian gas and oil and uh, a boycott, I think that was a, a true bipartisan agreement that, that we reached as a country. We reached it rapidly. And I think overall, uh, there's been remarkable bipartisan unity on condemning the brutality uh, an unprovoked nature of, of the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, I strenuously, in the strongest term, reject former President Trump's embrace and praise of, of Vladimir Putin. I'm, I'm, I'm outraged that a former president of the United States would, would even do such a thing. But bipartisanship is great, but it's hard to be bipartisan when you're willing to lie about valid election results. It's hard when you're storming the Capitol and your party calls that legitimate political discord. It's hard when you're trying to rob women of their reproductive freedom and right to abortion as well, too. Thank you. For the closing part of tonight's event, candidates will now have the opportunity to share a two minute, 120 second conclusion as to why they feel they're the most qualified to be the next Senator of Pennsylvania. And we're gonna start with State Representative Kenyatta. Well, first I wanna start where I began by saying thank you for putting this together, for putting forward um, so many substantive questions and um, appreciated this forum. On every issue that we've discussed and every issue that we will discuss and hopefully future debates and conversations, at the end of the day, working people poor people in this country, they bear the brunt of governments in action. We desperately need a senator that has skin in the game. We don't just need somebody cheering for the right direction. We need somebody who's leading our commonwealth and helping to be not just a vote, but a voice in a body that I think is desperately broken. If the Senate had more people in it who understood what I understand about our broken housing policy, about the fact that prescription drugs, the cost is out of control, that too many folks are working jobs and they're not family sustaining. If we had a hundred senators who understood that, we would have moved forward on addressing all of these things. We would have raised the minimum wage and passed the PRO Act already. We would have expanded Medicare already. We would make sure that we lead with diplomacy and not just with our military might already. I think we can have a Senate that does that. But if we're going to change the Senate, it starts with changing the senators. I'm Malcolm Kenyatta. I'm a working person running for the US Senate and I wanna earn your vote this May 17th. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Eric Gerhardt. Uh, well, as you can see, I had a little bit of fire right there, but don't expect nothing less than that when I get in there, if you vote for me. Um, lived in Pennsylvania my whole life. I will probably die in a state because it's just, you got every season. It's a beautiful state. I don't want to see a change. I don't want to see this country change to something that is left or right. I want to see it come to something that where we are all together. But you're not going to get that when you're voting for Republicans and Democrats because they just divide and conquer the people. Um, I'm a libertarian um, for peace and doing it the right way. Bad blood makes bad blood. Am I going to rattle some people's cages? Yes, I'm going to rattle some people's cages. I'm going to give everybody my ideas. You can steal my ideas. You pretty much are already working for me if you steal my ideas, though. So you should really give me the job. Please go to ericforpa.com. Donate, support my campaign. 
I'm going to do my job and get on the ballot so that every single Pennsylvanian has a chance to vote for me. Republicans, Democrats, I don't know who they're going to pick, but I'm going to try to do my damnedest to be there. Thank you. Mr. Lou Tapera, two minutes. So the reason, again, I've said it a million times uh, at my public events, but the reason I'm running is because I am, everything that you hear these people talk about is, it's, it's me and the job is not getting done. Hence now I have to do something that I just frankly don't have the money for. I don't have, I, I just saved the $5,000 I have to give the state of Pennsylvania on Monday. Like I don't have that money. I make under $70,000 a year and I have no health insurance. But these people will keep telling you, oh, I'm for the poor person. Really? I, I was at Temple University two days ago, Ferry, Ferry Ave, I thought my transmission was gonna fall out. Like, when are we gonna, oh, but, oh, wait a minute. It's because poor people live there. But I live in King of Prussia and the roads are beautiful and Kelly Drive is beautiful. So we keep talking that we're gonna help the poor and, and help the needy and, and all this stuff, but it's just not happening. And I'm the 188 pound proof of that. Uh, this is a hundred dollar suit I had to buy at Men's Warehouse. Like, I don't have the money for this. Um, but we have to run because we are not represented in Congress at all. People throw the little red meat again to the base. People are like, oh yeah, I'll vote for this person, this person. And then how come change never came? It will not come. It will not come. It will not come for the middle class until the middle class is in Congress. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman. Yeah. Once again, I want to thank the organizers and thank the University of Pittsburgh and thank all of you that are watching and, and asking questions. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to, to be here today. And uh, uh, I want to really emphasize just what's at stake in, in this election. It is the single most contested Senate race that's flippable for Democrats in the entire nation. It could very well determine control of the United States Senate. And I don't have the market cornered on electability. I want to be clear about that. But I do believe that we could turn that seat blue for sure. And I base that on our campaign that has remained ideologically consistent with core democratic values and principles from my first campaign back in 2016 to the candidate that is sitting before you as Pennsylvania's Lieutenant Governor, not having to evolve on issues like minimum wage, health care, the union way of life, women's reproductive freedom, never had to do that. But at the end of the day, it's critical that our grassroots campaign, you know, we are able to win in November. It's just a fact. It's gonna be a tough cycle for, for Democrats. If just history alone, not talking about the pandemic and, and inflation. So we have 185,000 donors and 90% of Pennsylvania zip codes. We have created a new map, a new map in Pennsylvania, electorally speaking. And we believe you're gonna need a new kind of map in order to have the strongest chance to turn this seat blue because ultimately we can have the greatest ideas in the world. We can be on the right side of history, but if we come up short and allow the Republicans uh, to take this seat, you know, that could have profound ramifications for our nation going forward. I humbly ask for your support and, and vote. If you trust me with your vote in May and ultimately November, if I prevail, You'll always have my vote on core democratic values, principles, and ideas if uh, I'm in Washington, D.C. as your senator. Thank you. Council Khalil. Thank you again for having me at this wonderful forum. I'm deeply appreciative. I'm Alex Khalil. I'm a borough counselor. I understand communities. When I am in working in my community, I think about all of my community, the Republicans, the independents, the Democrats, my Republican uh, res uh, Residents say, hey, you're our, our counselor. I promise you, if I go to the United States Senate to represent Pennsylvania, I will remember every community that I have met, every member of this community that I've met. I'll remember Lou and I'll remember the lady up in uh, Clarion County who couldn't afford their prescription drugs. I'll remember the immigrants who, got, who are being robbed in Philadelphia. I'll remember the undocumented women who are being victims of violence. I'll remember the Haitian refugees and Palestinian refugees and Syrian refugees and Ukrainian refugees. I do work. I actually get things done. As a local official, that's what we do. We have to get it done for the entire community. We work with the community. 
We can't sit back and say, well, you know what, our Republicans down the street, they're, uh, they're sewer broke, or our Republicans down the street, uh, they're having uh, the businesses were robbed, or our independents, they're our neighbors. And that is how we at the local level work. We work all the time with our neighbors. And I will bring that same attitude and that same work ethic to Washington, DC. I respect all my colleagues in, uh, who are running here who are Democrats and all of us will serve you well. But I promise you very none of them will remember community the way I will and will remember you the way I will. I'm not afraid to stand up for people who are uh, in the shadows or who are not of a popular uh, community. I'm the daughter of Palestinian immigrants. I'm proud to say that I'm a Palestinian immigrant and I will stand up for Palestinian rights. I will stand up against Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, against racism, against uh, homophobia throughout the world. I'm not afraid to stand up and fight for you. Thank you. Thank you to our candidates, the University of Pittsburgh, specifically the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs for providing the venue for today's event. The moderators, the staff of the World Affairs Council, Casa San Jose, Pump, and the Women and Girls Foundation, and the attendees that came together, together to make today possible. Thank you so much for turning in virtually or attending in person for either this forum or both forums. Have a great evening. Thank you.